1979, Japan believed it found the perfect way to fix a problem. They had an issue with a deadly snake commonly called the Habu snake on Amami Oshima Island. For years, the venomous snake terrorized villages. They bit farmers in their fields, frightened children walking home, and sent hundreds of victims to crowded clinics each year. Something needed to be done fast. So the Japanese came up with a bold idea. They decided to release snake killers on the island to solve their snake problem. Unfortunately, 25 years later, their bright solution turned into something unexpected. Amami Oshima, a subtropical island in southern Japan. The island is popular for its unique wildlife, but it also has one of the country's most dangerous snakes, the habu, Protobothrops flavoviridis. This pit viper usually grows to more than a meter in length. It moves fast, strikes without much warning, and its venom causes serious harm. In some cases, its attacks are even fatal. Habu snake bites were quite frequent, especially in rural areas. Dozens to hundreds of people were bitten in the Okinawa Anami region during that period, and the residents lived in a constant fear of being bitten because, quite frankly, there were loads of snakes. Now, don't get me wrong, medical help did exist. It just wasn't always helpful. Antivenom needs cold storage and hospital access, so if you got bitten in a rural area, treatment was often delayed due to a combination of logistics and infrastructural failure. Plus, the island's isolation and its scattered population made it almost impossible for quick medical responses. As a result, such delays were often the secondary cause of fatalities when the antivenom didn't arrive in time. So if the country couldn't take on a large-scale project to transform the electrical and medical landscape of the island, something else needed to be done. People started thinking of a biological solution. What if they found a natural enemy of the habu snake? And they did. The small Indian mongoose, Herpestes auropunctatus, sometimes referred to as the Asian mongoose, is well known for its ability to attack and eliminate snakes. However, they aren't specialized snake hunters. They often prey on other animals as well. Regardless, many people thought that bringing it into the island would be the perfect solution at that time. It was a no-brainer. The idea was simple. Bring in an animal that hunts snakes and the danger should go down, kind of like introducing a cat to a house infested with rats. Around 1979, the experiment kicked off, and records show that about 30 mongooses were released into the island. People were hopeful, especially those who had long feared the habu, but what no one realized back then was how far reality would drift from theory. At first, the mongoose plan sounded clever, yet once they began roaming the forests of Amami Oshima, the truth quickly became clear. There were loopholes within the plan, quite a number of them in fact. One really big oversight was behavior. Mongooses are active during the day. Habu snakes, however, are mostly night crawlers. That meant they barely crossed paths. Instead of seeking out the snakes, the mongooses spent the day hunting whatever was easiest to catch. And what was easiest? Well, other things like small mammals, frogs, and insects. Unfortunately, this led to snake populations staying high. Additionally, the problem worsened because of the mongoose's adaptability. In just a few years, their numbers rose like crazy. By the year 2000, the mongoose population had grown from a few dozen to an estimated 10 thousand, and that definitely wasn't good news. Of course, the locals were also disappointed because the snake bites didn't suddenly vanish. Scientists who studied the situation later said the plan failed because the animal's natural rhythm did not align with its intended prey. It also failed because the mongoose wasn't really a snake elimination specialist in the first place. Yes, they can fight snakes. However, the mongoose don't heavily depend on them for food, and this aspect should have been taken into consideration before they were brought to the island. Back then, the main focus was to solve the snake problem as quickly as possible. Hence, the Japanese didn't fully consider the long-term impact on the island's ecosystem. By the late 1980s and into the 1990s, it became obvious that the mongoose plan didn't just fail, it created a whole new problem for an already fragile environment. Amami Oshima houses lots of rare species that can't be found anywhere else on the planet. Such species exist 
solely on this island. For thousands of years, they evolved all alone, so they didn't really need to deal with mammal predators. That changed once the mongooses spread. One of the first and most vulnerable victims was the Amami rabbit, often called a living fossil because it's one of the oldest rabbit species in the world. It reproduces slowly, with nests in underground burrows. Hence it became easy prey for the agile mongoose and was soon threatened with becoming endangered. The birds suffered as well. The Amami woodcock is a rare ground-nesting bird, but it too became easy prey. Its eggs and chicks lay on the forest floor, so they got consumed in large numbers. And still, that wasn't all. Reptiles and amphibians also suffered from the mongooses. Frogs like the Amami Ishikawa's frog, another species unique to the island, were hunted aggressively. There's no denying that beyond the drop in diversity, there were other far-reaching effects from these losses. Fewer rabbits meant the vegetation in some areas grew unchecked, and that significantly altered plant communities. Although it was significantly less documented, it's logical that this effect also reduced the number of birds and frogs, while insect populations increased. This led to an imbalance in the forest's habitat, as every missing piece in the chain weakened the island's natural stability. What was meant to be a simple solution to one problem spiraled into many more. By the 1990s, scientists sounded alarms. They carried out surveys, which showed that the mongoose populations had spread much farther than where they were originally released. In contrast, the numbers of endangered animals continued to decrease, and what made the situation even worse was how fast the population was declining. Because so many of Amami Oshima's animals existed only on this island, losing them here meant losing them forever. Conservationists called it a global crisis concentrated in a small corner of Japan. The Amami rabbit in particular became a symbol of what was at stake. Protecting it wasn't just about the island anymore, it was about protecting a crucial part of history. Let's not forget, the snakes were still present. However, a much bigger threat came from the very animal introduced to fight them. By the turn of the millennium, Amami Oshima wasn't just dealing with a predator, it was dealing with a full-blown invasion. By the late 1900s and early 2000s, the mongoose population grew very rapidly, and in just two decades, they spread across most of the island, creating what biologists called a severe invasive species problem. Even researchers were shocked by how fast their population grew. Very few people expected the mongoose to thrive so explosively, and soon even residents noticed the change. Forest walks where people could see the natural wildlife grew quieter. Even though the habu snakes were still dangerous, villagers now spoke just as often about the new menace prowling their land. Soon, government reports started taking note of the ecological disaster. Also, biologists warned that if something wasn't done soon, some of the island's native wildlife would disappear forever. For the first time, officials admitted openly that the mongoose project was a failure. Instead of being remembered as a bold solution, it resembled one of the worst ecological mistakes Japan ever made. Furthermore, the situation made the locals tense. On one hand, the mongooses promised safety, and some residents still saw them as useful against rats. Still, the loss of wildlife was hard to ignore, and scientists were increasing the pressure to take action. It was a kind of push-and-pull situation. Protect the island's rare animals, or continue tolerating the mongoose. However, by the late 1990s, the choice couldn't be avoided. If something wasn't done immediately, the mongoose wouldn't just persist, they'd dominate the entire island. This marked the beginning of a difficult and new chapter, one where eradication was the only way forward. Subsequently, by the early 1990s, the mongoose problem couldn't be ignored. In 1993, municipal offices around Naze started trapping mongooses, labeling them as harmful wildlife. That local response pushed the Environment Agency and Kagoshima Prefecture to step in and run a broader study. From 1996 to 1999, a national model project mapped mongoose distribution and tested out ways to capture them. Unfortunately, they realized that simple trapping methods wouldn't be enough. The mongoose were everywhere. Field teams learned fast. They realized that mongooses are adaptable, and they'd need to continuously refine their trapping methods. Therefore, control methods needed to be adjusted every season, as well as site by site. Those lessons shaped the larger eradication approach that came not long after. 
In addition, the public's sentiments shifted as well. Farmers who tolerated the animals once upon a time now reported increasing losses in their farms and livestock. The pressure for a better and more coordinated solution kept increasing as half-hearted local responses couldn't work anymore. To be clear, eradicating an invasive species is never quick, nor is it easy. Amami Oshima's mangu story proves to us just how grueling it is. For nearly three decades, progress came. Sometimes it was fast, other times it was extremely slow. But it always kept moving towards the ultimate goal of removing every single mongoose. For years, the fight against mongooses on Amami Oshima was scattered and local. But in 2005, things took a major turn. That year, Japan's Invasive Alien Species Act came into force, and it brought a big shift. The Ministry of the Environment now had the authority and the funding to expand the campaign across the island. Suddenly, eradication wasn't just a local project. It became an official government policy. For it to work, a dedicated on-the-ground team was created, the Amami Mongoose Busters. From that moment, the fight entered a new chapter. The new effort was larger, more organized, and carried out with greater determination. The team kept working across the forests, valleys, and farmlands. They organized thousands of box traps and checked them every morning. In addition, each capture was logged with details such as location, date, weight, and sex. This record-keeping became a key part of the campaign. Furthermore, the scale was astonishing. Thousands of mongooses were removed over the years. Each number held great promise towards fixing the ecosystem. Nevertheless, simply using traps wasn't enough. The island's terrain was rugged, and mongooses are clever animals that quickly learned and adapted to avoid the traps. Over time, the campaign didn't just get bigger, it had to get smarter, too. Tech was brought into the mix. Motion-triggered cameras showed movement patterns and pointed out exactly where the survivors were hiding. Additionally, by the 2010s, specially trained detection dogs joined the mission. Their noses could track mongoose scent trails even where traps failed. For teams struggling through dense undergrowth, the dogs were invaluable. None of this would have worked, though, without money to keep the program running year after year. The Japanese government supported the effort year after year, even when success didn't feel like it was achievable. Locals also played their part by calling in sightings when they noticed something. Despite slow progress, conservation groups praised the persistence. They called it a rare example of long-term commitment. For the people of Amami, it became more than an environmental project. It was a community effort and a fight to protect the island's identity. By the 2010s, the results were clear. Captures dropped from hundreds each year to only dozens, then to single digits. At the same time, native wildlife returned. Farmers began noticing the Amami rabbit more often, a creature that once seemed on the verge of disappearing. In the forests, the air filled with louder birdsong as species like the Amami thrush and Lids jay started to return. For the first time in decades, nature was winning. Yet everyone was still cautious. People knew that even one breeding pair could undo years of work, so monitoring continued. The teams kept moving through the woods, cameras rolled through the night, and the dog stayed on the scent. Everyone was worn out, but nobody thought about stopping. Then came the breakthrough. In April 2018, the very last mongoose was captured. After that, nothing. No new tracks, no captures, and no sightings. Officials waited for six more years, unwilling to declare victory too soon. Finally, on September 3, 2024, the Ministry of Environment announced what once felt impossible. Amami Oshima was mongoose-free. Think about that. A predator introduced decades earlier, which spread across mountains and villages and pushed native species toward extinction, was completely removed. Very few places on Earth can claim such success. Globally, eradication of invasive mammals is usually limited to small and uninhabited islands. Amami Oshima, with more than 60,000 people, shows that conservation and community do work together. However, the work isn't done yet. The 2005 Act still underpins prevention today. Strict rules on imports, continuous monitoring, and community awareness programs are all in place to make sure mongooses or any other invasive species can never get so rooted in a space that isn't theirs. The lesson is clear. 
One careless introduction could lead to decades of struggle. So what can we really learn from the mongoose experiment on Amami Oshima? In the end, it's one of Japan's clearest lessons that interfering with nature is never as simple as it might seem. At first, the idea made sense, but as time went on it became obvious that the plan opened a door to a much bigger problem. First of all, ecosystems aren't simple. They're more like webs, intricate and complex. The mongooses didn't just go after snakes, they hunted easier prey like birds, rabbits, and lizards, and that threw the ecosystem out of balance. It shows how changing one part of nature can end up changing everything. There's also a lesson about quick fixes versus long-term planning. At the time, releasing a predator seemed faster and cheaper than investing in healthcare, like building better hospitals or making antivenom widely available. But the mongoose plan was only a short-term fix, and its consequences dragged on for decades. In the long run, proper planning would have been much safer for both people and the environment. And finally, the biggest takeaway is prevention. It's always easier to keep an invasive species out than to try wiping it out after it's settled in. Amami Oshima pulled it off, but only with huge amounts of time, money, and effort. Most places won't be able to do the same. But the Amami Mangu story isn't just a local tale, it's part of a bigger global picture. The mongoose population at Kawainui Marsh has exploded in recent years, killing endangered birds. Around the world, invasive species are one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss, second only to habitat destruction. The United Nations has warned that these species cost the global economy hundreds of billions of dollars every year, from rats on remote islands that wipe out seabird colonies to Asian carp overrunning rivers in North America. In that context, Amami Oshima is considered a rare success story, an inhabited island that actually won the fight. The timing of the victory was also symbolic. In 2021, UNESCO named Amami Oshima and nearby islands a World Natural Heritage Site, praising their unique mix of subtropical forests and rare animals. That recognition put extra pressure on Japan to follow through with the mongoose campaign, and made the 2024 declaration of success even more powerful. The island didn't just save its wildlife, it secured its place on the world conservation map. Even now, scientists aren't relaxing. They're running DNA tests on soil and stream water to make sure no mongooses are hiding, and they're documenting how species like the amami rabbit, woodcock, and rare frogs are bouncing back. For biologists, the island has become a living laboratory showing how ecosystems can heal if given enough time, resources, and determination. And for the rest of us, it's a reminder that fixing ecological mistakes is possible, but prevention is always the wiser path. What's more, the lessons from Amami are now influencing other conservation programs across Asia. Techniques pioneered here, such as long-term monitoring with camera traps, detection dogs, and environmental DNA, are being copied in places battling invasive snakes, toads, and mammals. This means that Amami Oshima's struggle, while painful, could help other islands avoid the same mistakes and recover their ecosystems faster. Do you think Japan could have handled the invasion incident any better? Leave your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to hit like, share, and subscribe for more videos like this.